Sports are all about being strong and pushing through the pain. Sadly, that lack of conversation speaks to the situation at hand and that it's not a priority always for coaches or players or teams or departments to force those conversations because um, they can be hard and they can be uncomfortable. So I went to Lawrence University for two years in Appleton, Wisconsin. So coming into Pomona Pitzer, it was like I was at a point personally where I was so comfortable with who I was that it wasn't, I didn't even think about like coming out per se to my team. It was sort of just being open with who I was. It, there didn't need to be this big event or moment. It was more of just being authentic and myself around them. I think this is a major issue facing American culture, but just this idea of empathy and putting yourself in someone else's shoes and putting yourself in someone else's situation. Um, and just thinking, you know, like, from a language standpoint, what words am I using that are somehow belittling this person? Or how can I think about a way that I personally feel belittled or marginalized or who, who close to me who I can recognize that this is an issue and that this is happening? And hopefully I'm that person in some cases and, like, people realize that I'm never going to say these hateful, homophobic things because my best friend, my teammate, my, you know, person who I'll fight for on the field is that person who I want to stand up for. I spent a lot of time playing tennis in an inner city community in Oakland. Um, and by no means was I from this community. I just, we just found this coach who didn't charge these students and a lot of the players there were lower income mostly black um, and just like didn't pay for lessons. They just, we would just come to the courts and hit all the time. And my mom drove us like 35 minutes from our house to go there every, uh, every day, every night, because she just like, she just liked this person's values. She liked how there was no bullshit. Like people were just like playing with anyone and like we were, they were all good players. and. Um, and because I spent so much time playing tennis there, it was like four or five years, I never understood why people thought that like, you have to have the latest gear to be the best player, or like you can only talk to certain people, or like, or like just this like elitism of like people looking down on, um, so the tennis world can be really, in my opinion, of what I've experienced, really racially charged and really insensitive. And I just never understood that because I didn't, I didn't see that as like, I, I saw a world outside of that where tennis still existed. Good tennis still existed. So my freshman year, uh, I had first started playing uh, Division One athletics at University of Montana. I'm actually a transfer student this year. And I think I was kind of going through what a lot of other queer athletes were going through at the time, kind of a lot of the similar struggles. Um, However, in November, um, I actually got a call that my um, my ex-boyfriend of maybe on and off for about two years in high school, um, who's on the tennis team with me, had uh, committed suicide. Um, and I think, I mean, that was how I came out to my <laughs> to my family, <laughs> telling them I needed to come home, um, you know, to be with our friends and to be with our team, our tennis team. You know, I, I can't speak on behalf of like what caused him to actually make that decision to take his own life. Um, however, I do know that he was deeply uncomfortable with who he was trying to rationalize his identity as a tennis player and a man and a queer person as well. So I think um, he really struggled with that in such like a heteronormative society. I think I found it even more pressing to understand the different struggles of queer individuals and p 
people of color, like the struggles that they go through as an athlete because I didn't really realize like how easy I, I had it um, until I'm kind of, you know, reviewing in my head just kind of the amount of stuff that, that um, my ex-partner had to deal with um, in high school. As far as being an ally, I think I was always kind of like, you know, like, yeah, I'm gay, but I'm also so many other things. And when my friends are like, like, want to like address that, like, that's cool. But like, I'm not just like a gay person. But I really realized that I have made closer relationships with those individuals because I think while we're at the Claremont Colleges that might just seem like a given, it wasn't something that I had always felt growing up in Idaho. Um, you know, I think from a lot of people it's like, it's like, I love you, but like, let's kind of like sweep this thing like under the mat, you know what I mean? Um, and so I think like, it's best for me like when I have like friends that are allies when they just like, honestly just like explicitly state like, you know, like, you are queer and I still love you so much. I think that that honestly really, really helps me. Um, not in the moment, but just like in general with my relationship with them, I just feel more comfortable with them when I feel like accepted and celebrated as opposed to like tolerated. When your team is like so white and so like, when like it's, it's dominated by one group of people, I feel like the danger with that is that we tend to think that all our stories are the same. We have the same um, like thought patterns and like we come from the same places, we grew up in privilege and we all are here the same way, which certainly is not the, the case. I was born and raised in, in Bulawayo. It's like the second largest city in Zimbabwe. Um, I grew up, uh, I've been public school my whole life. I, uh, I grew up with my grandparents uh, and my cousins. Um, I have always loved to play sports since I was, since I was a little kid, uh, soccer and track. Um, I wouldn't say it's a very, very big metropolitan city like LA, because it's obviously not. But it was a, it was a, it was a decent city, population of about 900 to a million people, and it's very different in terms of like dynamics and like people composition of people to here. I had never been that very close to so many white people uh, but when I got here obviously that changed and in the soccer team especially and in most of the teams here uh, that's the case like our teams are so white it was kind of tough sometimes uh, not that the people in the team uh, were bad people but just the fact that there were there weren't many or any other people that look like you in the team was just uh, a kind of uh, uh, an adjustment for me to make. As athletes who push our bodies, everyone is always sore. Everyone ice baths. Everyone is in pain to varying degrees, but to be expected as individuals who push our bodies three hours a day, six days a week. And for things like mental health and chronic disease, it can feel like you're fighting for validation when your pain is so invisible to the outside. I have an auto-inflammatory disease called AS, ankylosing spondylitis, which is a systemic condition where my body is constantly creating inflammation. Um, which results in the fusion of the spine if the disease progresses. My hips, my hands, um, and my neck. So, what this means for me is that 
this is something that I haven't really talked about, just because chronic disease in our society is so misunderstood and stigmatized, and when something is so constant, it, um, it's hard to explain how my relationship with my body is, is a lot different than what I understand is most people's, because I am always uncomfortable and in pain to some degree, but it's a pain that I've learned as a part of just who I am. Um, so when I talk about chronic pain, it's, it's like a fact. Our coaches often tell us to make sure we're taking care of our bodies, getting into the training room, heating up before practice, but it's rare that our teammates and our coaches are checking in about mental health, overall well-being, um, just as much as, our, as physical health. So I think it's really important that as we start to have more conversations about identity in athletic spaces, we give space for the invisible conditions and invisible experiences that people go through. From New York, um, born and raised. It's the best city in the world. Volleyball is a very white sport. And I think that Filtering happens a lot, especially at the collegiate level, as the skill level rises and it becomes much more about whether you played for elite clubs and like had the money to go to play for these elite clubs. And I think that that's not as much a part of the conversation, like the systemic like cycle as to why there aren't more players of diverse backgrounds in collegiate sports. The focus on a physical and performance-based culture shift, I think only perpetuates this notion that that's really all that matters and that there's often an overlooking of other aspects of collegiate sports and like this lack of diversity that doesn't really get discussed. What happens when that pain is coming from your personal life? You might break down. I broke. During my freshman year, I was sexually assaulted. Someone tried to force themselves into me. The sexual assault brought out all of these memories that I had suppressed for years of being raped in junior high. I couldn't push through this pain, and yeah, I just broke. My college track times were slower than what I ran in high school even. My teammates would joke about my times, and obviously that hurt. <laughs> but I also didn't know how to tell my teammates what was going on. Obviously I want to win, but in order to win you need to have everyone at their best and if someone's not feeling good you can't win, so it kind of goes hand in hand. If there's conversation around the subject, uh, a lot of people like understand better where some of us come from, uh, where some of us what some of us have had to go through to, like, to be in institutions like these ones and uh, on sports teams.